So um, I think this morning was really fascinating. I really enjoyed listening to those talks. And you've got to remember that some of those will be the innovations of the future. But unfortunately, the past is very relevant as well. And there's still issues in terms of what we really do know evidence-based. And I think we still have trouble delivering. And so I think the theme of my talk is to just reinforce some of the things that we really should take away from today and be implementing in our units at the moment. And I think the talk this afternoon on the radiology will also be very relevant, and you'll see why I say that later on in the talk. So if we look at the mortality of ARDS over the last sort of 20 years, it is obviously improving. And this graph was published in 2009, it's quite interesting, but obviously it ends in 2004, and we've gone beyond that now and by another um, 11 years. But at the end of this sort of time period, the mortality here is somewhere around about 30, 35%. We've got the Berlin definition, which I think is quite an important piece of work just to make us focus a little bit more on trying to stratify ARDS into not just a single entity, but making some attempt to uh, stratify it according to the um, PA to FI2 ratios. And so we come up with this sort of map of what we know currently as to how we work with patients with ARDS. And there is this stratification of PA to FI2 ratio and the different sort of modes of ventilation we might like to think about. And I want to just talk about some of these through the morning. So if we go back to 1998, this was one of the first sort of papers published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Amato from Brazil, trying to show a difference with protective strategies of ventilation. And essentially, he showed a mortality of 38% in his um, uh, treatment group, which was a lot better than people had published on up until that time. And he used uh, pressure control ventilation with inverse ratio. <coughs> and he used um, the compliance curve to set his PEEP, optimize his PEEP. And he, with that, he was using PEEPs of an average of about 16, which was a lot more than anyone had really done before then. And then, of course, in 2000, you've got the ARDSnet low tidal volume ventilation study. And this was a fairly important paper at the time bringing the mortality down to 31%. So these mortality figures in red are th sort of 30-day mortality, all right, extracted from the papers. Um, and we all should know this paper very, very well. And the interesting thing to me, in particular when this came out, was they were using this um, algorithm to set PEEP according to FI02. And this has become fairly important over the next 10 years. And just to sort of pitch 0.5 FI2, about 10 of PEEP, going up to sort of 12, 14, 16. Not many patients were getting onto these sort of levels. And certainly in the UK, in this time frame, hardly anyone would be using these sort of levels of peak. So what's the problem with um, looking at this and implementing it? Well, we find that throughout the last 10 years, there's still a problem in uptake in this sort of strategy. So this was published in um, 2008, and essentially it's from American intensive care units, um, which were actually involved in the ARDSnet study some eight, nine years before. And on a regular basis, they're still not achieving the target volumes that uh, were talked about in the ARDSnet paper. And we have to contemplate why that uptake is so poor. Can we really ignore the evidence? So there's this paper from the BMJ in 2012. It's quite a long study looking back over an experience of 485 patients. And here again, we have the same problem that only 40% were achieving a lung protective strategy. But there's a very strong message in the outcome mortality data that if you can adhere to lung protective ventilation, you significantly reduce the mortality risks. And these are longitudinal studies over two years. And here, if you do manage to get up to these 100% adherence, you can really make a difference in terms of outcome. All of those studies really are t focusing purely on low tidal volume ventilation. There's not much discussion about, about um, PEEP and recruitment, and we're going to go on to look at that in a second. But before I do, I just want you to look at this study and the next one. So this is the OSCAR study data from the UK for oscillation. And we're going to hear a lot about oscillation later, and I'm not going to talk about it. But I want to, what I want to focus on is the control group, which was the conventional ventilation group. And in the UK, in the control group in OSCAR, the mortality is 
In the Canadian study, which is very similar in its design, <coughs> the oscillation mortality is again 41%, but what I want you to focus on is the control group is 29%. So this is a similar group of patients to those that were in Oscar in the UK, but the Canadians can achieve a mortality of 12% better than us. I think we have to reflect on that in this room today. This study used a slightly different PEEP algorithm. It was more aggressive than the ARDSnet one, going to higher levels of PEEP at lower concentrations. So I said 10 of PEEP at 0.5% was the uh, ARMA study. This one is using higher PEEP settings. So let's just look at one last paper. This is a small paper, but when it came out, it was the lowest <coughs> mortality that had been achieved in ARDS. This is a group of just 50 patients in a unit in uh, Utah, Salt Lake City, I think, and 30 of them had ARDS. It's pandemic flu time. They achieved a mortality of 27%, but what they did was just adhere very closely to the ARDSnet criteria. That's all they did. There was no rescue therapies. It was just really tight, screwed down, six mils per kilo. So you can get down to these sort of levels. Can you do anything extra? Well, we've got the Papazian study from Marseille, which is interesting, using paralysis in the first 48 hours in uh, ARDS. And this paper, I think, is very important and adds something to our previous sort of strategy of low tidal volume ventilation. And in this study, the mortality at 30 days is down to 24%. So we're really starting to make some big impact in outcome differences now. This is a very tightly controlled 6 mils per kilo with a PEEP strategy similar to the ARDSnet study plus paralysis for 48 hours in the first 48 hours. And the first time someone is starting to sort of comment on stratification, so he split his study into patients with a PO2 FRT ratio at... Uh, um, introduction into the study of less than 120 and greater than 120 and showed that the real impact in outcome differences is with these very sick patients at the sort of high, uh, lower levels of PO2 FRT ratio. Let's just go into recruitment for a little bit. So what do we know about recruitment? Well, the philosophy is that you've got a hysteresis loop, which is inspiration and expiration, and we're very focused in the last 15 years on this bit of the curve, but probably this bit of the curve is obviously as important or if not more important, and we'd like to believe we can get patients up onto this bit of the curve and keep them there. And so there's a group of studies trying to achieve that. Alveoli was one of them. This is again the ARDSnet group, and they used a study with a recruitment maneuver, six mils per kilo, and then two PEEP strategies to hold the recruitment maneuver. In yellow in the control group is the original algorithm of PEEP setting against FI2 from the ARMA study, and then in the blue is the uh, treatment group in this study that alveoli has moved to, a higher um, PEEP setting. Unfortunately, in this study, it showed no significant improvement in using the higher PEEP strategy and possibly harm, and the study was curtailed early, so never achieved power because of a trend towards harm in the treatment group. But the 30-day mortalities in the lower PEEP setting was 24%. So again, this figure of survival is coming, uh, getting better and better. The mortality is, is lower and lower. There's two other studies very similar. There's the Love study from Canada with Mead, which was... Um, uh, no, that wasn't talked about earlier. And then there's the Express study with Mercat, which was mentioned earlier. Both these studies have very similar designs, but with the essence on a recruitment maneuver and then PEEP strategy to set. However, in none of those three studies was the, the treatment group better than the control group, and the range of outcomes in the control groups was, as we've said, 24 at best in the Alvalier study, about 27% in the other two studies. So recruitment maneuvers followed by high PEEP settings may not be the way to go on the basis of the evidence that we have in the literature. Because you've got to remember this is outcome data and that's really what we have to focus on. This, this, is, this is where we should be, is taking note of the outcome data. So there's a very interesting meta-analysis that Putinson did to try and answer some of these problems. And he took, uh, it's a meta-analysis, he, he took a lot of studies published on ventilation strategies over the last 15 years, and he stratified them into groups to try and answer these questions. So was lower tidal volume ventilation um, better than higher tidal vol volume ventilation using similar PEEP levels? Was low tidal volume ventilation with different PEEP levels which was better, 
and um, combinations of high tidal volume with low peep and low tidal volume with high peep. Essentially, based on the evidence from all of the uh, data, I'm not going to show you the, the whole study because it's very complicated, but I'm just going to summarize it, and it's worth reading this study if you want to have an overview of where we are with ventilation. There's very strong evidence in all of the studies, obviously, that low tidal volume tends to be beneficial in patients with ARDS. I think that's irrefutable based on what I've shown you already. He can find no evidence for high peep strategies to improve mortality during low tidal ventilation. And when I say high peep strategies, this isn't the ARMA study peep setting. This is the higher peep settings that people have gone on to try and do. So what we should be contemplating probably best evidence is the ARMA PEEP algorithms. Um, however, if you use high PEEP strategies during low tidal vol volume ventilation, it does appear to reduce the incidence of the need of rescue therapies. So in patients in studies that had ARDS with low tidal vol volume ventilation and going to higher <coughs> PEEP settings, it appeared in his meta-analysis to possibly modify the need for rescue therapies. But that's the only trend in the data to suggest that we should be going to higher PEEP settings. What about if we think about different endpoints? Can we do anything clever then? Well, I think in all of the focus on ventilation, everyone is obsessed with low tidal volume at the moment, and that's relevant. But I think there is a trend towards benefit in terms of reduced time on ventilator if we focus on fluid therapy and how we manage the fluid therapy in our patients in the UK. And this is, again, from part of the ARDSNET group. It's an older study now from 2006, but just showing that if you are fairly restrictive with fluid therapy in the sort of, once you've resuscitated the patients in the first 24 hours, if you then move to a more restrictive therapy, you can get reductions in uh, ventilation time uh, on the unit. And then we've got the future, possibly. We've got the ability to use extracorporeal CO2 clearance in patients, not ECMO. This is simpler. More units will be able to do this as the technology comes to the marketplace. And in doing that, you can actually go to even lower tidal volumes, three mils per kilo, perhaps, and show reductions, again, in lengths of time on a ventilator. Neither the fluid therapy or this yet show improvements in mortality, but you might get patients off the ventilator faster, and we may not have powered the studies adequately yet to see whether uh, mortality is improved. If you want to use in the kind of results that are in these studies, then you have to stick to the protocols. So what happens if we do that? Well, this is a slight problem. This is an interesting little study, 30 patients, really impressive authors, and it's done in the States with um, 30 patients, and they were CT'd while having ARDS and ARMA-type protocols, six mils per kilo, the PEEP algorithm from ARMA. <laughs> and what they found that was within the group of patients that were scanned, there was a subgroup of 10 who appeared to have hyperventilation during inspiration, okay? So these were set with a plateau pressure of 30, six mils per kilo, but this subgroup were up getting hyperinflation, which potentially is damaging. And when they looked more closely, they found that actually this group were tending to be uh, at the higher level of the plateau pressures that were necessary within the mandated six mils per kilo and PEEP settings. And so we have to be careful, even if we believe in everything I've said so far, it may not be perfect for all of our patients. And certainly this subgroup went on to show significant differences in cytokine production from the alveoli. So we have evidence from a cytokine point of view that the lung was being damaged in these patients. If we actually understand what we're doing better for individual patients, can we make a difference? Well, I do believe we can. So here is the sort of concept of what we know is going on in the lung. We've got the weight of the overlying lung affecting the compliance as we move from anterior to posterior, particularly in a supine patient. But as well as that, we've got consolidated lung often, particularly in our patients with pneumonia. And the compliance of consolidated lung is incredibly high, potentially. So where we've got consolidation, we've got the lung unit with edema, fibrin, etc. And recruitment of this is incredibly difficult unless we use extremely high uh, transpulmonary pressures. However, where we've got collapsed lung, from the weight of the overlying lung, this lung can be recruited um, using our sort of PEEP strategies and recruitment maneuvers that we've talked about. 
So it starts to become important to understand what's the pathology of the individual patient we're treating. And I think this is shown really nicely in um, this study that I'll show you next, sorry, after this slide. So basically what I'm trying to say now is that if you've got focal loss of aeration, so a pneumonic type process with unilateral damage, you'll have a huge difference in compliance between healthy lung and the diseased lung. So going to these high PEEP settings, we're really in danger of overstretching the healthy lung. Whereas if we've got a more diffuse pattern of injury to the lung, we can start to get away with these higher PEEP settings that we've described in some of the studies. So I think it's very important trying to understand what the patient actually has wrong with them at a pathological level. And so we move on to some of the principles of proning. And obviously proning essentially is stiffening the anterior chest wall and changing the distribution of ventilation into the lung. When the patient's supine, a lot of the ventilation is here in the anterior part of the chest wall, whereas the perfusion is best posteriorly and in the bases. Once you go prone and stiffen the anterior chest wall, you're forcing more ventilation down into the base and posteriorly where the perfusion is optimized. So your VQ matching will improve. There's this study from Gonier in France in 2003. It's 25 patients with ARDS in a CT scanner. And what he did is he ventilated them at four different PEEP settings, 0 to 15, in a supine position, in a prone position, and he looked at the improvements in PO2, FiO2 ratios. So in this subgroup of patients, when he turned them prone, there was improvements in PO2, FiO2 ratios, and as he went up the, with the peak, there were improvements in PO2, FiO2 ratios. That's everything we would believe would happen. However, because he was CTing these patients, he could stratify them. And so you have patients with diffuse ARDS, what he was calling secondary ARDS, more ho homogeneous lung injury, and in these patients, what you see is much the same. You get an improvement in PO2 FiO2 ratio as you go up with the PEEP in the supine position and in the prone position, and there's an improvement in the prone position compared with the supine position. So it's similar to the graph I've already shown you. However, if you look at the subgroup of patients with pneumonic process with more unilateral damage to the lung, okay, what you have now is very little benefit with going up with PEEP, but you still maintain a benefit by going from supine to prone. And I think this is a really important study to understand. Gattinoni was one of the first people to really push proning and try and understand it and try and show benefit. And unfortunately, in the early studies in 2003 and 2006, he was unable to show benefit in proning. So this is from one of his early papers. It shows improvements in PO2 FiO2 ratios, and, but in the end, in terms of improvement in PO2 on proning. However, there's no ultimate benefit at 30 days in outcome. We've already heard from our first speaker, Pratik, that there was a trend to uh, showing that if you can recruit the lung and improve CO2 by lowering end tidal CO2, you're getting lung recruitment, that you will have a trend towards better survival. So that was quite an interesting just sort of finding, but we've talked about that this morning. However, there's now been many, many proning studies, and so the emphasis in sort of 2009, 2010 was to start to look at them in more detail and do meta-analysis. And people started to look at subgroup analysis and pick out patients with uh, the higher um, PO2 FiO2, sorry, the lower PO2 FiO2 ratios, and begin to show possible benefits. And there's both um, two sort of meta-analyses, one from that group and one from UPAPS, and this is from the French, another meta-analysis, meta but it's the same sort of data. They used a cutoff of below 150, but if you look at all of the work done on proning and you look at this sort of subgroup, you start to see these improvements in outcome. So the study that anyone interested in proning was waiting for was this study from Gurin, which was published this year. And so here we've got a study where you have patients who have ARDS for more than 24 hours. They have a PO2 FI to ratio of less than 150, otherwise they're not recruited into the study. Um, an FI2 of greater than 0.6, a PEEP of 5, and they are ventilated with a fixed tidal volume of 6 mils per kilo. They're prone for 16 hours a day. Um, for up to seven to eight days, the average was four days, and prone was ceased when their lung uh, mechanics and ventilation improved. The very important thing in this study is the outcome in the treatment group. He's now got the 30-day mortality down to 
So over the last 12 years, we've seen fairly well controlled studies with a theme that we've followed, and we've now got the mortality down to 16%. And I think you have to start to accept that a lot of the ARDS mortality we're dealing with is actually caused by us and the way we look after patients. The disease hasn't changed in those 12 years. The strategy of how we treat the patients has changed and needs to change and be more consistent using the evidence that we have to date in the literature. So we may think we're very clever with this, but in 500 BC, Hippocrates knew that you were better prone than supine. Okay, that's my talk. Just for something to think about.